About a year ago, we covered ASA on this channel. And in that video, I asked the question, is ASA the most underrated filament with its UV and temperature resistant properties, as well as its ability to be printed a bit easier than ABS as far as the warping side of things goes and the odor side, it definitely checks a lot of boxes and makes it a fantastic candidate for functional 3D printing. And I've certainly seen its adoption over the past year. There's a lot more ASA coming up in conversations. It's becoming more readily available. And I've seen a lot of people using ASA for their Voron builds, as well as printing with ASA on their finished fully enclosed 3D printers. And another factor is the price. Price for ASA has also come down. And at the time of making this video, I've been able to find a couple spools of ASA hovering around the $30 price point, which is much better than the 40 ish or 40 plus price point that I saw when making that video again last year. Today we're going to be looking at a very unique filament called lightweight ASA. Just like regular ASA, it has fantastic UV and temperature resistant properties, but the very unique property of it is that at certain temperatures, the material will actually foam or expand up to two and a half times in volume, giving you incredibly light pieces that will allow you to scale back on your printer's flow rate. This is unlike any other filament I've ever used before, and today we're going to talk about its properties, how to print with it as far as the requirements and settings go on the hardware and software or slicer side of things, some of the applications I've thought of that I think that this will be a fantastic filament for, and of course, we have to do some printing ourselves. So with all that being said, and without further ado, let's get right to today's video. Massive thanks to Thanks for sponsoring today's video. With over 2 million index models in their database and growing regularly, Thanks finds the exact model that you're looking for. Thanks has some pretty unique features, like the ability to perform a geometric search or the recently added AR mode that I love. I'm a very visual person, and having the ability to place a 3D model in your space before actually printing it for reference can be quite useful. Also, it's a lot of fun and can make for some great photos. There are also great collaboration functionality baked right in, like the ability to create a private team for working on projects where you can keep track of things like different model versions as well as revisions. You also have the ability to follow a user's project, which is great for any that are actively being updated. Things has been developing new features for their site constantly, and I'm really looking forward to seeing this platform continue to expand. Links will be in the description so that you can find out more and check out things for yourself. Starting off, let's talk a bit more about the properties of this material. And unlike ColorFab's ASA, the ColorFab TDS for the lightweight ASA doesn't contain a lot of information other than the material's density range, depending on the foam, that it has the UV resistance of standard ASA and the heat deflection of around 96 Celsius, putting it on par with their standard ASA. And I believe the reason for this is because depending on the temperature you decide to print it at, it will have a major impact on how much the material foams. And that will also, that combined with your flow rate just gives it a massive range of what those settings can be. And it makes it very tough to have things like strength or flex tests on that TDS. Before ColorFab released their lightweight ASA, they have had a lightweight PLA on the market for some time now. And it essentially works the same way. It has the same kind of foaming properties, but the main difference is it's PLA based versus ASA based. So its temperature resilience as well as its UV resilience is going to be substantially different. And early last year, Stefan over at CNC Kitchen did make a very, very good video covering this material. And there is certainly some crossover, I feel, between that material and this material as far as just how it works and how the foaming process works. And in that video, he did cover a lot of different tests as far as strength goes. And the main takeaway I got was yes, the more the material is foamed and the less density it has, the weaker the part is. And that did not scale uh, in a linear fashion. And so again, if you are really interested in some of the strength properties of it, I highly recommend checking out that video maybe after this, and I will place the links in the description where you can do so. During my testing, I posted a video on TikTok showing the same part printed in lightweight ASA versus PLA, showing the massive difference in weight between those two parts. And I had a request to print out the exact same little piece in both of those materials and just show how they snapped when I applied force to them. Now, this isn't scientific. I can't guarantee I applied the same level of force, but I did think that the results were quite interesting and wanted to share them. The PLA being a very stiff and brittle material, I was expecting it to snap or almost shatter, but that wasn't the case. When I snapped the PLA piece, it actually sort of bended a bit and you could see the different color as it's the stress as it kind of deformed. While the lightweight ASA, granted this was maximum foaming or maximum expansion, it shattered. Like it, it had no give once it got past a certain point, it just completely shattered. And so I do think just right off the bat that if you are looking for maximum strength more so than lightweight, 
Sticking with something like a standard ASA is definitely going to be your best bet. That being said, I do think this lightweight ASA has some really unique and cool applications for things like drones, RC planes, RC boats, and cosplay specifically. It just seems like it checks a lot of boxes, but we'll get more into that a little bit later. As far as printing goes, I'm going to be using the iFast from QuiddyTech, which is a monster machine I've been testing out. Don't worry, you don't need anything nearly as big or as crazy as this printer as the requirements to print with this material are really on par with standard ASA. As far as the bed goes, you will want to make sure you have a heated bed that could reach about 100 Celsius, which good thing is most common printers now can do that. As far as the actual surface material goes for adhesion, I'm going to be using powder coated PEI, but regular smooth PEI, build tack, uh, glass with some kind of ABS slurry, or even old school glass with hairspray will do the trick as far as adhesion if that's the route you want to go. As always, having a high quality extruder like something with dual gears is going to be a better option, but just about any standard Bowden type extruder or direct drive extruder should be absolutely fine with working with this material. You will, however, need an all metal hot end, although you can print this material as low as 235 Celsius to really take advantage of its foaming properties and experiment with the entire range that you can print it at. You will want to make sure you have an all metal hot end and not one that's PTFE lined. The material is not abrasive, so you are going to be fine using your standard brass nozzle. And lastly, you will need to have an enclosure. If your 3D printer is not already enclosed, it's fairly easy to DIY something using either, I've seen insulated foam panels or acrylic, or you can pick up something like the Wham Bam Hot Box that just quickly zips together and you throw it on the top of your printer. But the main reason for that is we want to make sure we keep the chamber at a consistent temperature that will really help with cooling and any sort of warping from the parts shrinking. As far as slicing and calibrating, this material, the process is going to be fairly similar to the instructions outlined for the lightweight PLA, which I will also link in the description. The first step is going to be printing the filament in a wide range of temperatures. The foaming properties of this filament are triggered by the printing temperature, and although the foaming amount is consistent at that temperature, depending on your desired outcome, you'll want to find this sweet spot for your application. My goal is to find the maximum foaming so that I can create very light parts. The foaming for lightweight ASA will start at around that 230, 235 Celsius. So I went ahead and printed out single walled cubes three times. And at the halfway point, I entered a custom line of G code that basically increased the extruder temperature by 10 Celsius. So at the end of my three cubes, I had a half cube at 240, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90. 290 Celsius. After the cubes printed, I took my calipers and measured the wall thickness and discovered that the 240 to 250 Celsius range seemed to be the optimal range to get the maximum amount of foaming, which was 0.9 millimeters or a little bit over double of my nozzle size. At temperatures higher than 250 Celsius, I actually noticed a decrease in the foaming properties of this material. Once I had the optimal temperature for the maximum foaming of 240 to 250 Celsius, I needed to adjust my printer's flow. And for this, you can go ahead and print out a variety of different flow rates and then measure with your calipers where that gets you. But for me, I went ahead and just shrunk my flow from one to 0.5, cutting it in half, which when I printed it out, gave me a little bit over 0.4, which is exactly what I wanted. Now, this is where the magic really happens because you are able to print out parts with half of the material coming out, but because of that foaming, they actually look and feel like solid parts. However, they are very light in comparison to a non-lightweight standard material. I did a couple of small prints, but I really wanted to print something big, like a prop that would be used for something like cosplay. And although I personally have never cosplayed, I have a lot of friends that are really into cosplay and they have been using their 3D printers to make things like various armor or weapons or just different props. And so the idea of being able to print with a material that is going to have half the weight on something that you're wearing for many hours just seems like it would be really attractive to me. And combining that with the fact that when this material foams, it does a really good job of hiding the layer lines means that there's going to be much less sanding when it comes time to sand and prime and paint those parts for cosplay. And the last big thing is if you're using a material like PLA, the big concern is depending on where you are that if you're transporting your props or your cosplay that you spent all this time on in a car and you leave it in the car for whatever reasoning, there's always the risk that the parts will warp and deform. However, printing with ASA, whether it's regular or this lightweight stuff, the heat deflection of 96 Celsius ensures that if you leave something in your car, nothing bad is going to happen to it. 
I decided on a Mandalorian shoulder piece that I found over on Things that was created by Matthias. I will link you guys down below in the description. He also had a chest piece as well as a full helmet, and I am very, very tempted after printing out this shoulder piece to also print out the helmet, so that may be something I end up doing. For print settings in Prusa Slicer, I set the hot end temp to 245 Celsius, the bed to 100 Celsius with an extrusion multiplier of 0.5, and that's based on the foaming settings we previously covered. For ASA, you'll typically want no cooling, so I left that off, and I went with a 0.2 layer height with four perimeters as well as four top and bottom solid layers, 20% grid infill, three skirt loops to prime the nozzle, and a five millimeter brim just to make sure that there was no warping as it is a fairly large piece. Based on the manufacturer's recommendations, I did drop down the speeds to 40 millimeters a second for perimeters and 60 millimeters a second for the infill, which is a little bit above what they recommend. So if you do have any issues, you could always scale that down a little bit. I did auto generate supports with a 40 degree threshold and I used Prusa Slicer's magical painting supports, which we're gonna have to cover in a future video because it's amazing to paint a bit of supports on the outside. When I sent that off to be printed on the iFast, I also sliced up the file again with the exact same settings, but for PLA. So I changed the temp turned on airflow, and I made the extrusion multiplier one before printing it on the Creality Sermoon. They were fairly large prints at a bit over 24 hours each, so I did check on them periodically, but everything seemed to be laying down well, and looking on the lightweight ASA, it just looked like a cloud as it was laying down very smoothly. However, I did notice that there was quite a bit of little sections of tiny bits of extra material that had been extruded. So when the prints were done and I took both of them off the build plate, I was really happy to see that if I just took a finger or my hand and rubbed over the, the printed part, those little extra pieces just came right off and they didn't leave any markings where they were. So that was awesome. And I was also able to remove the supports very easily on the lightweight ASA, just using my hand and no additional tools. I wish I could say the same about the PLA part. Uh, it required quite a bit of prying using a spatula. And when I finally got the supports off, it flung up in the air. <laughs> Definitely a lot easier. I could dial in the supports for PLA, but the main point I'm trying to get home is that removing supports with this lightweight ASA is a breeze. Once I had all the supports removed, holding them in my hands, I could very easily tell that the PLA part was much heavier than the lightweight ASA part, but I wasn't entirely sure if it was exactly going to be twice as heavy or you know twice as light on the lightweight ASA because PLA and ASA in general have different densities and so it might not have been a split. Grabbing my mailing scale, I threw down the lightweight ASA printed part that came out to 3.7 ounces. And then I took that off and I put the PLA part down, which came out to 7.4 ounces, making it twice as heavy as the ASA part. Again, if I was going to be wearing a cosplay armor or creating something I was going to be carrying around all day long, if I can take half of that weight off of me, that is definitely something I'm interested in. Also, I have a feeling that because of the foaming properties that affects the density of this material, it would probably make a pretty big difference in the parts buoyancy, making it really cool for something like an RC boat if that's something you'd want to build with this material. From my testing, the foaming of this material is very consistent, and once you do the initial printing of the different temperatures to figure out how much of an expansion it has and adjust your flow rate, the rest of it is going to be a breeze. And as I mentioned earlier, that Mandalorian helmet, I've been wanting to print out a full helmet for a really long time, and using this material seems like a no-brainer, so I am probably going to be doing that in the coming weeks here. Colorfab does also mention that you can very likely print much larger than what your nozzle size actually is using this material. So just for fun, I did try to tell the slicer I had a 0.8 millimeter nozzle and print at something like a 0.6 millimeter layer height. And the results were not very good. The, the extrusion was quite inconsistent and I just wasn't very happy with the results. That being said, I do think that if you scale that down, I very likely could have printed at something like a 0.4 millimeter layer height on a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, which is not normally something you can do, but that's something I need to play around with a bit more and maybe we can revisit it if that is something that there is enough interest in. And that has been Lightweight ASA. If you wanna find out more or purchase this material for yourself, I will place links down below in the description. And if you do have any questions, I may not have all the answers, but if I see enough of the same question, I have no problem reaching out to the manufacturer directly to see if I can't get that question answered. 
Also, if you have any ideas for something that would be really cool to print with this material, let us know in the comments down below. I've been asking that question a lot more lately with like the glow in the dark resin or the copper fill material. And there have been some really creative ideas I just never would have thought of. So please share those down below. I'd love to hear more. And if you want to check out any of the other filaments we've covered on this channel, I can place the playlist for those various filaments in the description as well. On that note, don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you do want to support the channel furthermore, I will place links down below in the description over to our Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot, and I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.